Hi, Anna, by the way, just want to say hello, uh, because you came in and uh, um, so hi from my side. Yeah, hi, Anna. Speaking. Yeah, hi. Sorry, I Good to couldn't join you. you earlier, but I'm very happy yeah. to be part of thank you. this discussion. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Well, we've got our, we, thank you. And we've got the first three presenters, so that's that's good. There would be some some of the speakers joining a little bit later, especially uh, Dr. Regev, who is uh, joining from California. So that's really, really, really early for her. And we would start in one minute. But the number, the numbers uh, of people connecting keep growing. But I suggest we start. Does that work for everyone? Okay, then let's uh, let's start. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this online debate uh, organized by the Lifetime Project. Uh, my name is Marilyn Fiaschi. I am the Managing Director of Science Business, a news and communications company specialized in research and innovation policy. Uh, and it will be my pleasure uh, to serve as moderator today. Uh, we have a fantastic and very ambitious menu ahead of us today. Um, since, well, the objective is, uh, is really to to better understand how to tackle these challenges uh, we are facing in, in Europe. And we will try to come up with uh, concrete recommendations and discuss how to, to turn those recommendations uh, into concrete uh, policy actions. So uh, before we go into the chains of it, uh, there are a few housekeeping rules that, uh, that I will share. The first, uh, the first of the rules is the fact that it's a public debate, uh, which means everything that would be discussed is on the record. There will be a news story to be published uh, after this event, and also the video recording uh, will be made available. Uh, for those in the audience, you will have the chance to interact with the speakers uh, by using the Q&A function in Zoom. I will take question, uh, questions uh, uh, in the, in, during the panel discussion in the second part uh, of, the, of the event. And for those who want to tweet about the debate, feel free to do so. There is a dedicated hashtag uh, for, for the event. It's hashtag uh, future medicine and you can also tag the lifetime uh, project and the handle being lifetime ini like initiative maybe i can ask uh, our colleagues to put in the q a uh, the the hashtag and the handle the lifetime handle so that uh, people know so all right, with these, I think we can get started, but I think the, to, a nice way to, to kick off this event is probably to uh, make you all uh, more familiar uh, with the Lifetime Project. Some of you are very familiar, uh, but uh, for those who are less familiar with the Lifetime Initiative, we will start with a very short uh, video and that I will ask our colleagues to launch now. Times medicine falls short. Millions of European citizens suffer incurable long-term conditions that science cannot fully explain or cannot diagnose early enough. All these illnesses have two things in common, 
first, scientists still do not entirely understand the biological processes that cause them. And second, the diseases often go unnoticed for months or even years. So, when patients receive a late diagnosis, treatment options are limited and unfortunately they often fail. To address these problems, we have created the Lifetime Initiative, a group of nearly 200 research institutions, hospitals and companies with a common plan to develop new and existing technologies to understand how diseases evolve. We will study patient samples using single cell techniques to look at molecular changes in individual cells and not in bulk. Also, artificial intelligence will help us analyze samples from hundreds of thousands of patients to identify the recurring features of each illness. Thanks to this medical outlook, scientists will be able to develop drugs that specifically target biological processes underpinning each disease. The drugs will be tested in a personalized manner on organ-like structures called organoids, grown in the lab from patient samples. All these innovations will directly benefit European citizens. Doctors will test people for early signs of disease and provide timely diagnosis and treatments, so patients will be able to lead normal and healthy lives. So we will have the opportunity to go uh, deeper into what the Lifetime Initiative is about in a, in a very little while. Uh, but to start, uh, I'm very pleased to, into, to, to welcome our first speaker, uh, Professor Angelika Egert, who will set the scene with a very specific case study. Uh, Angelika is a professor at Charité University Hospital in Berlin. She's also a director of the Pediatric Oncology and Hematology Department at Charité. Angelika, tell us all about, uh, well, today's medical challenges. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, hello, everybody. It is uh, my pleasure to share my clinical perspective uh, with you about today's medical challenges. And as I'm a pediatric oncologist, my perspective will, of course, come from the field of oncology. So what is my challenge today in a simplified way? Um, there is a common pediatric cancer called neuroblastoma, a very common tumor. And uh, if we regard this from the pathologist's point of view, this tumor is all the same. Uh, the pathologist can tell us this is neuroblastoma, but nonetheless, we have very different causes of clinical disease. We have patients with stage one localized disease who are not a problem to be treated and have a survival of more than 90%. But on the other hand, we also have stage four disease. That means these um, children have a metastasized disease from the very beginning and their survival, no matter what we do, aggressive chemotherapy, irradiation, stem cell transplantation, is still below 40%. The pathologist cannot tell us the difference between these two clinical causes of disease. Of course, with my clinical experience, I can tell which patient belongs to which group, but still I need to find solutions for the patients on the right side. So there is a need to identify and to understand the cell types and the states that are leading to early cancer dissemination and also to therapy resistance that commonly occurs in the subgroup of patients. So where are we today? If we have a look at cancer precision medicine, we can do a lot already. So when a cancer patient, a high-risk cancer patient comes into our office, we um, initially take a tumor biopsy. We do bulk tumor sequencing. We approach it with bioinformatic analysis. And uh, by doing so, we can um, provide an algorithm prioritizing drug targets. We can make a choice of a drug. And uh, we hope to find a magic drug. We treat the patients. And in most of the cases, we still fail. Why do we fail in most cases? What, what is the wrong approach um, in this way? So in fact, there are limitations of our current approaches. Um, if we perform bulk sequencing of the whole tumor tissue, we can only capture 1% of the cell population and only get average results. And we miss two very important fields. One of these is spatial intratumor heterogeneity, where we can identify, for example, certain cancer stem cells in the tumor, where we can identify cells that tend to invade, to disseminate, and to build metastasis. And on the other hand, we also need to know what, um, what 
kind of resistance mechanisms are showing up in just a small proportion of the cells after treatment, um, leading to resistance of these cells to the therapy that we are giving to the patients. Um, in this arena, single cell data make a huge difference. Um, there is a nice quote of Besslin and Hicks from Nature Reviews Cancer, stating that the fundamental operative unit of a cancer is the genetically and epigenetically innovative single cell. And that single cell analyses provide the ultimate level of resolution in our quest for a fundamental understanding of this disease. And this is very true. To give you a more simplified version of uh, what it is about to understand this complexity of a cancer tissue, we can compare it to fruits. So if you have a look at the complex tissue in the fruit basket on the left, if we um, analyze this with bulk genomics, the result that we get is more or less comparable to a fruit juice. We cannot tell apart what kind of fruits are in there. And uh, we learn just a little bit um, about uh, the complexity of this tissue. If we then compare it um, and combine it with flow cytometry approaches, we can tell the different fruits apart in different juices, but still we don't see the single fruits. If we then involve single cell genomics, in addition, we can see the single fruit Fruits and we can kind of sort these fruits, but still we are lacking the ultimate picture. The ultimate picture in this scenery is a cake. So we want to see the whole cake. We want to see the single cherry and where exactly it is placed in the cake, because otherwise we cannot understand what's going on in the disease. And the option to do so is given by a new technology called spatial transcriptomics. So in the future, how might cancer precision medicine look like? We are not go only going to take tumor biopsies, but we are also going to take liquid biopsies in the longitudinal monitoring of the disease. We will apply single cell multi-omics innovative technologies, including spatial transcriptomics. We will use artificial intelligence for these huge amounts of data to dissect the data and come to the right results in respect to targets for molecular and immune therapy, in respect to resistance and metastasis, and um, in order to understand tumor evolution at the same time, we will generate from the fresh tumor biopsy patient-derived organoids and uh, patient-derived xenotransplantation models in mice, for example, to have so-called avatars for the patient that we can use for extensive preclinical drug screening that will help us to identify um, the suitable drugs, the most promising drugs, and all of these results are then discussed in molecular tumor boards. This links to the lifetime initiative because here I'm convinced we find the right approaches to address these medical challenges. Lifetime is about cell-based interceptive medicine. And of course, it's not only suitable for the cancer field, but for any kind of diseases, for neurological diseases, for cardiovascular diseases, for infectious diseases, for chronic inflammatory diseases, even to assess healthy aging. And the idea is to um, be interceptive in a very early way to early identify the diseased cell types, uh, to understand the molecular mechanisms behind these cells, and to identify new drug targets and therapies. And uh, the lifetime vision um, uh, relies on enabling technologies. And there are three major columns. On the one hand, um, the innovative technology development with a focus on single cell multi-omics and imaging, but also the artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions, um, and together applied to patient-derived experimental disease models. And uh, personally, I'm convinced that these cell-based interceptive medicine concept really has the potential to revolutionize healthcare in cancer and in all other fields in the near future. And this is why I'm so enthusiastic when I heard about the Lifetime Initiative and why I decided as a clinician to participate in it. And I hope all this will lead to awards an innovative biomedical AI ecosystem for the benefit um, of our patients. And by this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Angelica. You're making our job much easier now. Uh, now we uh, we know what uh, what single what, what cell-based interceptive medicine is, and you've done a very uh, very nice introduction uh, about the lifetime project. We'll actually 
stay on the lifetime project a little bit longer as I have the, uh, the pleasure to, to invite uh, one of the two coordinators uh, of the Lifetime Initiative, uh, Geneviève Almousny. You are Geneviève, you're an honorary director at the Institut Curie. You're also a director of research at the French National Council of Scientific Research, CNRS. You are a world leader in the fields of uh, genome organization and function during development and disease such as cancer. So you are coming not from, uh, uh, from a practitioner perspective, but more as a researcher and as coordinator of the, of the project. So uh, we had a very nice testimonial, I think, from Angelica. But tell us a bit more. What's, why can we, well, the Lifetime Initiative has been, was selected as, as, um, as a, a flagship initiative by the EU. Why? Why? The, the approach the project is proposing potentially a game changer to improve healthcare in Europe. Okay, so this is uh, a, a pleasure for me to be here and speaking after Angelica. Uh, I'm uh, really honored to get this chance. And, and I really think it's uh, because we are at uh, exciting times and uh, there has been a lot of progresses that have been made and we are linking now uh, the information that we can gather from uh, the genome to the cell. And the cell is the basic unit of our bodies. And we can use this for the patient. So we can get to know uh, all the cells of uh, our patients. So, so I think that the, the fundamental uh, aspect of lifetime, which is to go uh, for this cell-based interceptive medicine is really game changing in the sense that what we're aiming for is not to cure uh, uh, a disease when it is already very harmful. It's really to try and capture when things are deviating from the normal to be able to intervene very early on. And so that is really uh, changing the view uh, onto the uh, way uh, the healthcare could address a different form of prevention being armed with this understanding on when very early on you can trap uh, and identify the problem to target it very specifically. So, so this, is, this is really uh, important. And I think the example that, uh, that Angelica covered with cancer is beautiful. Uh, and it's something that is now uh, possible. But uh, it's also something that can apply to cardiovascular disease, chronic and inflammatory disease, infectious disease, neurological disease. Well, in the COVID-19, it has been already showing some interesting uh, way to approach the questions. Very good. And but so to, to make this approach a success, uh, we've heard uh, Angelica being part of the Lifetime Project, and she's a clinician. So I want to ask, what are the forces at play? Who should be the, uh, the stakeholders involved in the, in the process? Well, uh, I think this, this is uh, really uh, a central point. It's really an engagement of uh, a whole community that uh, encompasses a range of people. And uh, you've seen uh, in the short uh, movie at the beginning that there's over 200 institution, academic, industrial partners, funding, uh, policymakers. Uh, and uh, above all, I think it's very important to state the importance of the interaction with the patients and the citizen. They have to be engaged and understand uh, what we are actually uh, trying to do and um, be part of the movement to fully accompany it so that it, at the end of the day, we can propose something that will respect uh, what uh, people want and will be ethically sound and uh, will be easily uh, implemented and uh, accepted. <laughs> Very good. I, I'm sure that we'll come back a little bit later on the on this the question of the importance of collaboration, especially about the role of patients and why they should be involved. But another question that I have about the Lifetime Initiative is the, is related to data. Uh, so the, the proposed method that is based on molecular and single cell analysis generates tones of data. So with the objective to accelerate research and innovation in the field, what are the requirements or the needs to make the most out, out of this mountain of data? 
Well, I think it is absolutely true that the amount of data is really uh, scaling up. And so there's a need uh, to think about how to deal with it. And uh, that uh, will require to take advantage of uh, the European arena to, uh, uh, with what it does offer, because there's uh, already interesting and important uh, infrastructures with the S3 uh, available, and to uh, then uh, leverage this uh, by uh, acting together with uh, all the different uh, partners, the different uh, uh, countries uh, for the benefit of all without leaving behind uh, some uh, of the countries that may not have access to the most recent uh, advanced in handling or organizing their, their data. So I think that this is really uh, an important aspect and it should not be taken in isolation. Uh, I think you also need to link the data to the question, so to the medical aspect and to uh, the way you uh, deal with them with the scientific questioning and the understanding. So it's with these uh, pillars all together that it will uh, work. Okay, so that's a clear plea for, um, a clear pledge for uh, an integrated approach, right? So we'll, uh, that's also, it's very nice. It's going to fit very nicely the discussion we'll, uh, we'll get to. Um, one final question for you. Uh, so. The, the, lifetime initiative, uh, the lifetime initiative is still young. So what do you think uh, will be the long-term impact of the lifetime approach? Well, it's true, it's still uh, early days, um, but uh, the hope is uh, perhaps uh, the very first thing is uh, to find a way in a, a society where uh, we are living longer uh, for the citizen to live longer and healthier lives. So this is really the ultimate goal. And uh, for sure, uh, the other aspect from an economical point of view is also to boost up uh, the interaction with the industry so that the innovation can benefit from the advances and also saving for the healthcare system if we can avoid uh, running into situation that could be very costly to handle with the aging population. And uh, finally, I think it's also a, a unique chance today for uh, the EU uh, to fully exploit the potential to be a first line player in science and medicine uh, for the future. I think those are very wise words that we can uh, end up, uh, that, that we, where we can end your, uh, your presentation or your, uh, your introduction about the Lifetime Project. Uh, we will uh, hear once more about the Lifetime Initiative uh, in the conclusion uh, with the other coordinator of the, of the Lifetime Initiative. But uh, before we go back to some of these important points that you raised, Geneviève, with the panel, uh, we'll shift for a, little t for a little while from research to policy. Uh, as uh, I have the, the, the pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is Anna Lanroth. Uh, Anna, you're head of unit in charge of Healthy Lives, so quite promising. Uh, yes, it's absolutely research, right. <laughs> uh, in the Directorate, General, <laughs> in, uh, in the Directorate uh, General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission. And you kindly agreed to, uh, to give us a quick overview of what the Commission has in the works uh, for health research and innovation as part of, uh, of Horizon Europe. So uh, I'll hand over to you now for, for, this, uh, for this overview. And thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Marilyn. And as I said, it is really a fantastic pleasure to be here in this panel debate with you. Uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, uh, show a, a little slide presentation and I, I promise you I won't be long, it doesn't have a lot of slides, but I might help to understand a little bit more about Horizon Europe. So I'm going to try to share my screen, see if I can see if that works. Is that okay? Okay, I hope that look uh, seems okay. Okay, so yeah, so um, what I'd like to, to do is just to introduce you um, uh, to um, where we stand with the Horizon Europe and particularly then the health cluster. And here we have something we call strategic planning and programming. So um, just to put in context very briefly, I'm not going to go into details here. And I should say already also for anyone who wishes to have access to the slides, they are of course available to you, to you afterwards. You don't have to take notes like crazy. 
anyway, we are dealing with three pillars here. Um, pillar one, uh, which uh, has things like the European Research Council, uh, municipal security actions and research infrastructures that was already mentioned. Then we have pillar two, and this is where I'm going to talk about uh, mainly the health cluster in there. And there are a number of other clusters as well, as you can see. Here we're dealing with the global challenges and European industrial competitiveness. And then we have a third pillar, uh, innovative Europe, where you find uh, things like the European Innovation Council, European Innovation uh, Ecosystems, and, and the EIT. And then we have uh, the uh, widening participation and strength in European research areas. So this is quite reminiscent of the current Horizon 2020. Um, there are some changes, but uh, anyway, this is this is what we, what's prepared for the future, and this is also reflecting what's uh, what the Commission was advised to do for the future in terms of structure. So where do we stand? Well, the, a lot has been prepared on various levels, but we're still missing the very first important crucial uh, decision by uh, the, our um, leaders, I would say, in Europe, and that is the formal decision on the EU's long-term budget for the next seven years. And you may have followed the press that there is a, a blockage now in this process. And until this is unleashed, everything else that follows downstream here, as you can see, is also blocked. Although everything is prepared and has been prepared, some of these um, uh, documents in quite some time, negotiations are already concluded or more or less concluded. They are blocked until you have a decision on, on the budget. So without going too much into the details, uh, what follows the budget this, um, decision is a, a formal uh, decision on the Horizon Europe program as such, that is also seven years long. And then you have something called the first strategic plan of Horizon Europe that covers the first four years only. And then breaking down a little bit further is the first work program for the first two years that reflect the, the intentions of the strategic plan. So this sort of a, a cascade uh, can only be unleashed once there is a decision on, on, on the budget, um, so which we are desperately waiting for, I should say. So, uh, so what can uh, EU-funded research and innovation do for Europe, actually? Well, it's not just about, uh, uh, you know, uh, supporting research for the sake of supporting research. Of course, we need to ensure that we have uh, and preserve excellence and competence in Europe. This, this is absolutely clear. Um, but um, it, we need to have a purpose with this, huh? either building up our competitiveness or our, our uh, ability to do uh, top science uh, research in the future, or we need to target it to societal needs. So we have the three pillars that I already showed to, to you, and the uh, philosophy is a little bit different between them. We have the investigator and innovative uh, driven, the pillars one and three, I would say, the excellence and, and, and the innovation. Um, and then we have the impact driven uh, goal set through an inclusive co-creation and co-design process. Again, this is a pillar in the middle, uh, which has the health cluster that I'm going to focus on. So the philosophy is a little bit different be uh, be between, behind these uh, three pillars. So from now on, we'll really focus on the global challenges, industrial in, uh, competitiveness part. Uh, so this is really based on challenges that are spelled out, societal challenges, global challenges, and they're often interconnected as well. They require um, impact and purpose uh, uh, as working approaches and engagement with the uh, uh, wide range of various actors, I should say, to reach the objectives. And for that uh, purpose, as I already showed on the previous slide, we have a planning process. Uh, so um, we here agreed together with other stakeholders on key strategic ori orientations towards what we call expected or targeted impacts. Now, these also reflect the EU political priorities of Ursula von der Leyen. And here we're talking about things like the um, green and digital transitions. And we, uh, the latest kid on the block, I should say, is the preparedness and resilience that we, uh, what we, um, uh, our, uh, our politicians, I would say, have uh, identified as an important part uh, as the lesson learned from the COVID crisis. And then <clears throat> it's also a very strong feature is the early involvement of member states and European Parliament in this process. So I mentioned co-creation. Uh, if I didn't, I should have mentioned co-creation because co-creation is a really, really key word in the process. And it's something new that we didn't do uh, 
as extensively as all in the past. We have always consulted, there's no doubt about it, but not to the extent uh, uh, as we have done now in the preparation of Horizon Europe. So we first, of course, with the stakeholders and the citizens, there have been a number of open consultations at various levels of documents, first on the broad lines and then more on the, uh, on the finer details. We also organized two times now the European Research and Innovation Days. So I th we think that we are really taking all the opportunities in various contexts to really reach out to citizens and, and have them engaged. But then also with the member states, uh, a consultation through our, I would say, shadow program committees. They're called shadow before we have a formal agreement on the RS in Europe. After that, they are not shadow anymore. But we talk to the member states in this process. Uh, with um, a lot of also cross con uh, consultation of committees outside research and innovation, such as the uh, DG Santis uh, expert group, for example. Uh, then on partnerships and missions, uh, really engagement from the very beginning, and we've asked member states to commit to the partnerships, not only sort of lip service, but actually uh, real commitments. And that was done by the 15th of October, and we're really amazed by the positive response we received concretely from the member states to our partnerships, uh, at least in the health part. Okay, so, uh, and then finally, we also uh, co-create with other DGs in the Commission, Director Generals in the Commission. Uh, well, so we do the joint preparation of the program and the work programs in many, many iterations and discussions. So there are very intensive discussions there, uh, uh, but they lead to really a better understanding of the policy needs and the science that is available. So the emphasis in this process is not only to look at the science, but also how our program, research and innovation program can um, be coordinated and fit uh, together with other non-research EU programs. So if you look across the whole of the European Commission, the various director generals and the various programs, I'm not going to list them in detail here, but you can see how many players that are potentially uh, uh, running programs that are related in one way or another to health, although not health research. So we try to coordinate much better than we ever did before by engaging with uh, the SDGs in the discussion. And they have a huge say on the formulation of the priorities also in, in uh, our part of the research program. Uh, so really creating a family, if I may say so. Um, yeah, so where we are now and where we want to go. Uh, this is a kind of a broadened approach, if you like, uh, the towards the future that we really want. So we're talking about research and innovation strategic planning of Horizon Europe. So that's sort of the dark blue arrow in the middle. Widening that a little bit, we're talking about synergies across EU programs that I mentioned, even wider across EU policies and commitments. And then Further than that, the yellow arrow is really member states' actions at national and regional level. So hopefully we'll have far better coordination than we had in the past through this process. Now I'm not going to go into the detail here, just to remind you that we're talking about the scientific impact, obviously, and societal and economic impacts. And I think it's already been, been touched upon in the nice introductions uh, that we heard already. So I think uh, we are very much on similar lines, I should say, as a side comment in the middle of my presentation. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to say that. Um, so the pathway to impact, and this is a little bit new, I should say, what we used to have in the past, we talked about obviously about the research input, what applicants put into their applications when they apply. This is things like the human resources, the financial, the know-how, and, and the concept for the research project. Then the output is the results of the project at the end of the project. That's very easy. And this is what we used to focus on in the past. The new thing, what we haven't really discussed previously and uh, taken us a little bit of time also internally, I have to admit to understand, is how to formulate what we call outcomes. We've identified a, a user of the results being produced. They could be clinicians, could be policymakers, could be citizens, depending on what it is. So this is how uh, the, uh, let's say, the, the aims of research topics are formulated in the health cluster. And um, that would be very interesting to see how that flies, actually. And now everything, obviously, is targeting towards a broader long-term uh, impacts, but we don't expect individual uh, projects to directly have uh, such impact um, of that uh, dimension 
at, at the individual project level. So this is more, let's say, long-term contribution to those impacts. So that is a very important cascade and it's the outcome that is important to understand for the future, I would say. So I'm not gonna go into the details just to say that there are six uh, expected impacts of the health cluster is staying healthy and living and working in a health promoting environment. This is uh, in my unit so that we're working on those two. Then we have uh, the one on tackling diseases and reducing disease burden. Then we have uh, ensuring access to innovative, sustainable and high quality uh, health solutions. And then uh, looking at also new tools, technologies and digital solutions, and also maintaining a global competitive health industry. Uh, just a few words about missions. I'm not going to talk about that too much because I know that we have far better expertise around it, this in this panel. Just to say that missions is something new in rights in Europe that we're trying out for the first time, and there are five of them. They serve really to reach very tangible uh, and ambitious results within a defined time frame, and they also. Uh, aim to engage whatever it takes or whoever it takes to reach the ambitious goals. So this is a new way of working. They're not firmly uh, or only, I would say, rooted in a single uh, place, let's say, in, 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 uh, in the research program, but they can reach across uh, quite broadly over several uh, various um, parts of, of, the, of, uh, of the research program, engaging uh, various different, sec uh, different sectors. So it's a bit of a, let's say, an experiment, if you like, and we'll see if it flies out uh, well in the future. And the five uh, missions are uh, cancer, soil health and food, climate neutral and smart cities, healthy oceans, seas, coastal and inland waters, and adaptation to climate change, including societal transformation. And apart from cancer, if you think about it, there's health aspects in each and every one of those five, I would say, in one or another way. So that's the end of my presentation. And I'm very happy to, to discuss any um, thing you would like to raise in my, in my presentation. Let's see. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Thank when you. It, you stay with us for the panel discussion. Uh, and in fact, before I introduce the other panelists, uh, I see that there is quite some um, activity on the chat. May I ask uh, those in the audience who would like to address a question to the panelists to, uh, to write the question down in the, in the Q&A? function rather than the chat so that uh, we can monitor the, them more uh, easily and uh, we, we, we are carefully monitoring those questions so I will take questions from the audience. Uh, maybe not all of them, I see there are, there are quite a lot already which is really good uh, but uh, as, ma as many as possible. Very good, so uh, Anna thank you for this uh, policy introduction. I, I can't resist, do you think what are the odds that, uh, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but uh, can a budget a deal um, come well, I mean, thing? this is a very political thing going on right now. Uh, uh, I think we all follow the press and I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I had. <laughs> really, I, I, that would be really great. Uh, but uh, as I said, you know, all we can do in the commission, and we are there to serve only the process, as you know, huh? that's our role, is, is to make sure that everything is as well prepared as it possibly can be once there is a formal decision, you know, on the first, you know, important uh, prerequisite. You, you can't do anything unless you have a budget, you know, yeah. it, is a, it is a necessity. And then, you know, that, that we are not kind of stuck in, in the further decisions that are to be taken. So we, we're just a pre- prepared everything, yeah, ready, steady, go um, as quickly as possible. But surely we will have a little bit of a delay next year. Uh, I think that is inevitable. Okay. So, to the start. I mean, we're not starting on the 1st of January with the calls. We're not doing that. So it will be in the spring for sure. In yeah. the spring, yeah. April yeah. is... Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. is That's the... what we think now, yeah. Okay. We hope Very that there's good. not going to be even further delays. Huh? Then we will have to, of course, re reconsider that as well. Yeah. yeah, okay, well, that's a critical week for, uh, for the EU and for the for our rise in Europe, I, I think, uh, everybody thinks. Uh, very good. Well, uh, I'll now introduce the, on the, uh, the other uh, speakers who will now join you for, uh, for the panel discussion. So uh, with you, uh, there is Christine Chomien. Uh, Christine is the, the vice chair of the mission uh, board cancer. 
uh, the one of the mission that you uh, that you mentioned, Anna. Then uh, we are uh, also happy to welcome Domenico Di Martinis, uh, who come from the Italian uh, Ministry uh, of uh, University and Research, uh, and uh, so you come from the Director General for Coordination and Valorization of Research and its Results, uh, and uh, the. Office 8, Programming and Promotion of International Research and Coordination of Aerospace Research. So the title is, uh, is complete. Uh, we also uh, have the pleasure to, to welcome Stefan Elrich. Uh, Stefan is, is a member of the Board of Management at Bayer, Bayer AG, and you're also uh, President of Bayer Pharmaceutical. Uh, welcome and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, with us as well, Ali Vregev, so uh, the very brave Californian, California-based uh, speaker. Uh, she's the co-chair of the Human Cell Atlas, the head of uh, Genetech uh, Research and Early Development. And finally, uh, Manfred Weber, uh, a member of the European Parliament and chair of the EPP Group in the European Parliament. Thank you very much to the six of you for joining us this evening. Uh, we have plenty to discuss. We heard about, um, uh, when from, we, we had introduction from the, the practitioner perspective, from uh, a research perspective, and from uh, a policy perspective. So we've got plenty to discuss. And uh, I think I'm going to start with a very simple question. Uh, I think the, the, the COVID crisis has shaken up uh, the world, and with the hopefully the new uh, seven-year cycle, seven-year program cycle to about to start in the EU, uh, there is um, a unique opportunity and need to accelerate uh, innovation in health. So, what do you think should be the priority in terms of accelerating uh, innovation in health? Maybe uh, Manfred Weber, can I can I start with you? Absolutely. Welcome and good evening. Thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, yes, as a politician, I first of all have to underline that this week is an extremely important, even historic week for the European Union. And I also must ask the research community to, to help us in the European Parliament, because currently the biggest fight is that we link the European money to basic principles of rule of law and of uh, independence of judiciary and freedom of media. You know, that's not any more guaranteed in today's European Union. That's sad to say, but that's a reality. And that's why we have to pick up this fight. And that is creating the uncertainty, which the Commission representative already underlined for the debates uh, for next year about the implementation. And, uh, and for me, I tell you, when, when I started in campaign last year, we had a European elections campaign, you know, when we spoke as politicians last year about the priorities for the next five years. It was for me a miracle. It was a big surprise that the idea to look for a for one big project like fight against cancer uh, uh, that this was such a powerful tool also to attract people to make people uh, believe in Europe and to understand that together we are much stronger than than if we do it alone as as, as individual countries, and that was really powerful to convince people for a pro-European approach. And that was a base now to create the health plan and to create also the sectorial uh, programs, for example, fight against cancer, but all the other tools. Uh, and, uh, and that's good. So the last year was a boost for this, was a support for this fundamental idea. You know, we increased now the money for Horizon, thanks to the pressure from the parliament for about 4 billion euros additional money after the cuts from the council in July. And we increased the money also for the health program uh, for the European Union to around 3.4 billion euros. So that is a job we can do. So first of all, to let me say, create a public understanding that these investments are necessary and people can benefit. It is in our interest to do so. And secondly, then to fight in the daily life of, of us in the parliament together with commission and council for the money we need for these investments. And finally, if you allow, what we need is also broader support from you in the community to, uh, to go to the citizens and to, to win support for this. Because sometimes I feel that other lobby groups in a way are much more convincing than uh, what the research field is doing. And that's why to be connected to citizens, to tell them what does this mean for the private life, especially in the health field, is extremely important for us in our way. 
Very good. Uh, there's a momentum for cancer, but there's also, uh, I mean, not only for cancer, but cancer in particular. And I guess, Christine, you would agree with that? Yes, thank you all and happy to be with you and to participate in this uh, panel of discussion. And I thank the organizers for giving us one hour to discuss. Sometimes we have a, a very shorter time, so thank you very much. Uh, yes, I find that unfortunately the COVID crisis has really uh, put the finger on most of the difficulties that we have uh, to conquer cancer. Um, the knowledge, uh, of course, it's important to, to understand and of course lifetime is, uh, is there to to show how important it is uh, to move forward in diseases we still do not understand. And so the COVID crisis, we got faced with a virus we did not understand. It's also important uh, that we show, we, we noticed uh, how it was difficult uh, to convince the citizens about the risk factors. Uh, and do we have difficulty in communicating uh, with strong evidence uh, to the citizens and the patients to be able to understand that there are cancer risk factors and that they need to change their behavior. What we also understood with the COVID crisis is the need, and we saw it, thank heavens, uh, to get all the researchers together, whatever their field. I have a lot of uh, cancer researchers who put their uh, technology uh, to the COVID crisis and they were allowed to share uh, their expertise and to bring it to a new disease that was important for them. However, it's important that we understand also uh, the needs of the citizens. We are now going to face a crucial moment where the treatment is going to come. We have the vaccination which is there and we are faced with citizens who still feel not at ease. And unfortunately, France is one of these countries with the vaccination process, they need to understand why it takes time to validate a clinical research and to have strong regulatory moments. And they need to understand uh, the risk and the little risk that may happen uh, to such a treatment. So if it's not completely integrated from the beginning, uh, then we may miss completely uh, the uh, importance of all the research and the speed I really acknowledge the speed that research has made during this COVID crisis together with the pharmaceutical companies and even the companies who produce the vials to put the vaccine product in, everybody got together to answer the crisis. And I think it's very close to the mission concept. Very good. So I think that's a very, uh, very natural transition towards Stefan. And uh, since we've spoken about pharmaceutical companies, do you agree, Stefan, that um, uh, that uh, acceleration of health innovation is dependent on an integrated approach, and the role of, uh, of I mean, the importance of educating patients and the public? Uh, yeah. Th first of all, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, yeah, I surely do. Uh, I mean, I think if there was any proof needed, 2020 actually offers the proof. This is a, an incredible year because it basically shakes all of what we took for granted on the one hand, but then also is an incredible year for science on the other. And so, so um, it's, also, it's also, I think, a proud moment for European science, quite frankly, uh, because uh, it was uh, basically on a European technology that the first vaccine uh, has been uh, now, at least in the UK, that doesn't really count as Europe, but I guess, uh, I guess, I guess Europe is following suit this weekend or next week uh, with an approval of the first mRNA based uh, vaccine, which if my memory serves me well, that is a European technology and uh, was developed uh, in parallel, by the way, first by two German companies that, that started mRNA and then Moderna uh, followed suit. So in, in the US. So um, when, I, when I look at this, um, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible how we were able in 10 months to go from concept to a, a, a medicine and, uh, and come together like never before to, uh, to fight a very concrete health threat. And uh, I think what we've all done, uh, what we've all understood this year is that good health cannot or must not be taken for granted. Uh, 
And so that's where we need, yes, we need to come together and uh, we need to fight the other debilitating or deadly diseases that uh, currently do not have uh, any good treatment or not sufficient treatment. And, and I think this is where we need to best leverage uh, what we're so good at in Europe. And for me, we're really good at uh, basic research. Actually, many of our good ideas and many of our researchers from Europe end up uh, going to the US in the end because that's where they can better translate their knowledge and their uh, inventions uh, into something that, uh, that can ultimately, ultimately be used in people. And, uh, and this is where then most of the medicines ultimately get developed. So, so I think this is, a, this is something where, where we need to come together and, uh, and find better solutions, not only on how we best support um, our basic research in, in life sciences, but also how we translate that research into something that can be applicable in patients uh, and if you want any priorities for me, we've talked about oncology already. I, I could think of many rare diseases that uh, still have uh, big gaps. And uh, of course, also anything that relates to CNS, which is one of the most debilitating things and that where we seem to be really struggling and finding good answers uh, from a, a science perspective. CNS standing for? Oh, sorry. What so, is so, CNS? Uh, uh, here up here, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all these okay. wonderful bad things nobody wants to have, but that become more and more prevalent. Okay, so we'd have to move to the US in a second, but before we do that, uh, since we have some based in the US, uh, but before we do that, just stay in long, uh, let's stay in Europe a little bit longer. Domenico, do you want to bring just a, a national perspective on this very simple question? What do you think should be the number one priority in Europe to accelerate uh, innovation in health? Just very short introduction. Well, thank you. Well, um, I, want, I wanted to spend a few words about uh, the COVID-19 because, uh, you know, Italy was uh, hit hard by the pandemic even before you re we realized in Europe that there was an emergency. Actually, I'm not afraid about uh, the production of uh, science and knowledge in Europe. Um, I think that uh, um, we need as a priority to be able to frame uh, those data into a common knowledge. So um, call it as you want, but uh, um, uh, access and the common understanding of how those data are produced in Europe, at least among Europeans, I think should be a priority. Very good. And we'll come back to that because this is a key question. I'll now turn to Aviv because Aviv here is our, uh, our expert uh, in, uh, in the molecular approach and in single cell uh, genomics. So uh, Aviv, first of all, well, welcome and thank you for waking up so early. Uh, much appreciated. The, um, you are the expert. Yeah, so in the, the, the scientific expert in the field of uh, in the in, a, in in the same field as the Lifetime Initiative. So, can you tell us as well why do you think uh, well the, the single cell genomics and that uh, that part of, of science that is emerging in Europe does matter? And maybe you can also uh, take us to take that question from the international cooperation perspective. So, so I can, uh, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. And I wish 8.30 a.m. were that early, but <laughs> it's not. Um, um, I, I'll take it from two different perspectives. One is to try and explain why I think this is critical both for our basic understanding of biology, but also for our understanding of disease and for the development of medicines, which I think is really at the heart of, uh, of lifetime. And then I'll try to give a little bit of a perspective on international uh, collaboration and how I think this uh, specific field has been really empowered by it. So starting with uh, really the impact on medicine, on an our first of all, on our basic uh, understanding of biology, the, the, I think uh, Genevieve said earlier that cells are the basic unit of life. And um, given that, it is actually remarkable how challenging it has been for us to really understand them at that level. We could look at many of them together, or we could look at... Uh, sometimes very deeply at one of them and look at very particular features, but it was difficult for us to bring both of these views together. And these advances in single cell genomics and now in spatial genomics really allow us to look at things at the level of uh, both richness and scale that matches the complexity of the human body. 
And it gives us ways to answer many basic questions about how cells operate, how they come together in tissues. And it turns out that these questions can now be addressed in the context of humans. And this is where the impact on human disease really comes into play. If you go even, even five, even 10 years ago, I would say, and, and to a large extent, even five years ago, often when we wanted to study human disease, be it for basic understanding of disease or for development of new therapeutic approaches, we had to first turn to a model. There would be a cell line. Today, there might be an organoid. There would be an animal model. It was never actually the human. And that was our starting point. And after a very, very, very long process that started from that starting point and might have ended up with a hypothesis, and maybe at some point there was even the beginning of a medicine, that's when we got to turn to the human. And this was due to experimental limitations of what we could actually learn directly from patient samples. What single cell genomics and related approaches help us do, along with the contribution of computational approaches, is that allow us to take a human first approach, or sometimes we say human as the model organism. We can start with a patient sample and study it with the same amount of, uh, uh, with the same level of resolution and precision that in the past we could only apply to models. And in fact, it is now more, more precise and more elaborate than we would have done with uh, models in the lab because it actually have, has all of the components of the relevant biology. So this human biology first approach is absolutely critical for our success with, um, with everything from understanding human disease that eventually happens inside humans, with understanding basic biology better because the truth is that our models are not the full complexity of biology. They're just a cell in a dish or they're an animal in an animal facility, whereas humans are actually a more complex situation than those. So it's a harder biological question, but it is also much more likely that we will be successful when we try to develop therapies for patients because we started with the patients first. And then we took this tour of understanding what is going on in the patient. And then from that, we developed our therapies. So, so I think from all of these perspectives, this is what these types of fields have brought to us. They brought us to a, the ability to start it that way. They also give us the opportunity of having our cake and eating it too. Uh, in the past, we had to choose. We either could go very broad, for example, with genomic approaches, or we could go very deep, for example, with cell biology approaches. When we wanted to go deep, we had to make choices very early on. For example, a hypothesis about a particular pathway over a particular gene. Um, but we would learn a lot, very, very deeply. When we wanted to go broad, we could, we could be very agnostic and look, for example, at every individual gene, what would happen if I knock it out? But we would have a relatively limited amount of information on what might be the outcome. For example, the cell lives or dies, or the level of expression of a particular marker, reporter gene. Today, we can actually have our cake and eat it too. We can go with both the breadth and the depth simultaneously. So for example, we can perform very sophisticated screens in a dish or in an animal or by using human genetics by looking across hundreds or thousands of individuals and yet get the richness of information at the same time. And this okay. is what we need in order to solve these kinds of difficult problems. Okay, but that does raise a question, and Genevieve Valder um, asked when mentioned the, the, the ethical question, because uh, then there's um, a question of public outrage, right? That should be uh, that should be raised here, and that's actually a question for for all of you. Uh, is there an ethical question raised by interceptive medicine uh, or? Uh, how, how, what, what should be communicated to the, to the people? I, I, maybe I'll, I'll pick up on that. I think there is an ethical Yeah, and question. then the others can come in. Yeah, there is an ethical question and we have a great responsibility around it. So first of all, when we, uh, when we study human samples, we have to take it with the utmost um, ethical care. Um, we have to consider privacy. Genetic information reveals information about individual's identity. And so it has to be controlled and it has to be both ethically consented for collection, but also once collected, it has to be handled with, um, you know, the utmost responsibility. And this is both a, a public policy question and a legal question, and it is also a technical question. Today, we have better opportunities of how to handle the privacy of information using, for example, computational means coming from computer science than we might have had in the past. At the same time, we have opportunities to anonymize this information. There is a lot of information that we can glean after we strip away 
a lot of the identifiable data. And as a result of that, we can have the medical benefit without compromising individual privacy. Very good. Who else would like to come in on that question? Stefan, I see. Oh, Domenico first. Go ahead, Domenico. Well, sorry, Stefan, if I took if, if I took a space. Um, well, this idea of the interceptive, uh, inter interceptive medicine is great. And um, I know that life science needs numbers. Uh, what should be uh, considered is uh, not the, the problem, uh, rather the, the opportunity. I mean, science doesn't need uh, the personal data of a person, need data that need to be used for, for, for uh, the, the, the development of the, the cure po possibly. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice opportunity that we can study human models, uh, in, like in this project, and uh, we need the numbers. Uh, we know, we know, I mean, no, we Europeans, uh, we, uh, we know how to, uh, to protect privacy, so we could, uh, we could implement the protection of the privacy. Um, this is, I think, when the stakeholders, the policy makers, and the communication with the citizen come into, into place. Um, it's, it's important because if you want to have, uh, um, you, if you want to control uh, to have uh, uh, um, to measure the the, the potential in, in coming of, in coming of a disease uh, before before the the symptoms are are uh, are out, uh, you need to have a continuous screening. So you need to sensibilize the citizen to the opportunity that we have, rather than the problem. Okay, so citizen seems to be directly involved in the process. Uh, that's an important point. In terms of very important reason in terms of information. Very good, and it's well information, but they need to to uh, to be um, well to to be directly uh, on board with the concept. So it's even more than information, if I understand correctly. Stefan, you wanted to come in, and then Christine. I think I think the ethical question in innovation has been asked uh, as long as uh, humans have been creating innovation, because with every step of the way, we had to also uh, question ourselves again around the ethics of everything that we do. I mean, who would question when you break a leg that you should repair the broken leg? Nobody would question that. But we do question when we have a broken gene that we may do the same sort of uh, with a different technology, obviously we don't put a piece of, um, I don't know, uh, whatever we, know, we, we use to, 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 to set the leg straight, straight, but it's more sophisticated. So uh, the minute people don't understand things, uh, very quickly it, it becomes an ethical debate. And I think it's, a, it's the right thing, right thing to have, but we should not be um, uh, closing our eyes in front of what, what, what we know today, what we didn't know then. and, and we're reading and we're writing new chapters in the book of biology and it's amazing how much how much we still need to know uh, we're now going and diagnose at the cellular level uh, and not just at a, at a at one cell but we're now looking at it in, in three dimensions and, and 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 can can from there all of a sudden differentiate between i don't know uh, broken tissue and uh, and and healthy tissue or, or sick tissue a healthy tissue and that will that that allows us to look at things differently and to die, not only to diagnose differently, but also to treat differently. And, and then we will have to probably also adjust as we move forward, some of our ethical thinking. Think about gene therapy, okay? Um, so this is something that is heavily debated, especially in Europe, uh, be it in red uh, uh, or green uh, gene, gene uh, genomics. And then uh, think about the current vaccine. We're mass vaccinating with mRNA now, uh, all of the Europeans, um, I'm not hearing a lot of debate around the ethics of using um, a, a gene therapy, if you like, because mRNA in the end is that, uh, at least in my book. And, and it, I think it comes to show that when we need it and when, when it makes sense, we can actually advance also in our ethical thinking uh, as, as we look at science. And 2020 has been an, an extraordinary year uh, to, uh, to put I think, into a certain um, equilibrium, what the scientific uh, question at hand is, 
with what we as a society need to do and how we need to focus and how we need to give answers as a society to, a, to an impending scientific question, uh, which was the virus ultimately. So, so I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, hopefully teaches us a lot of good lessons that we can then apply to other diseases in the future. Very good, Christine. Uh, no, just two points. One, I wanted to agree with Stefan, and I think that probably ethics uh, is just not in the hands of a few in the ethics committee. Uh, I think everybody has a specific view on ethics, and so it's nice to have uh, everybody once again uh, on board to be able to, uh, to give their opinion of what they think is their ethics for a given subject. If in this specific case of... Um, of human samples, and I can only uh, agree with uh, Aviv and also with the lifetimers approach uh, to really su support research based on samples, human samples. Um, I personally have uh, results in, in, uh, in patients uh, where we would never have seen uh, the results if we did not work on patient samples. The cell line and the mouse models were not uh, there to, to help us. Um, what, the, what the patients and the citizens tell us in our mission approach on cancer, um, they do not want the samples to be wasted. The biopsies are now smaller and smaller. They're asked by everybody, the pathologist, the genomics, the immunologist, uh, and they would like, and the pharmaceutical company, <laughs> sorry, Stefan, um, and so uh, they do not want it to be wasted. Uh, they want uh, a more comprehensive way of using their samples and, of course, sharing the data that one obtains with their sample. Very good. Angelica, you're still with us, so, and I think you want to make a comment, so please come in. <laughs> yes, I think in the same direction as you already mentioned, um, it's not enough to involve ethical committees, but it's of utmost importance not only to inform patients about um, the potential that scientific approaches have, but to actively involve them from the very beginning and hear the strong patient voice. And I think this is, uh, of course, in, in all uh, preclinical and clinical scientific endeavors, very important and for this purpose we have of course to adequately train the patients so that they can judge the value um, of preclinical and, and clinical research um, and this I think is ongoing um, in, in all European countries right now to start this from the very beginning and in respect to the models um, and to the patient material yes I agree that patients want to carefully um, want us to carefully select what is done with their precious material we cannot use it for any kind of research um, that is not worth it. Um, and here we have to define where we can work with models. And for a lot of questions, we can work with models like Lifetime is doing with the organoid models. But every kind of model, of course, has its limitations. We had some discussions in the chat about um, animal models versus organoids. Both are both have advantages and, and disadvantages. There's no such perfect model that will absolutely mimic what we find in the patient. We need some models uh, in a living organism. We need other models um, that is a stronger human component. But we have to focus on further development of these models because patient material indeed is limited and we can only provide it and use it in the sense of the patient um, if this is really meaningful research that is done with it. Very good. Avi first and then Anna. So uh, a couple of comments. First, for uh, the point of the models versus the human material, I think one of the benefits of the high resolution methods is that they help us adjudicate the models to say, this is how the model is similar. These are actually the mm -hmm. distinctions and even raise new approaches as to how to make the model better. So if you have an organoid and you compare it to the tissue it is derived from at very high resolution, you can say, oh, that's what's missing. And here is some signal that I see in the human tissue, I can now engineer it better. There's a virtual cycle there. The second point on the patient material being limited, I think one of the benefits, not just of the experimental approaches, but for the computational ones, is that we're increasingly getting to the mode that we might not have to do 700 different methods. We might be able to learn a model that takes the measurements made with one method and predicts, basically generates 
the results of another method without ever applying it to the sample, which is going to be absolutely critical for limited human materials and is within the realm of what modern machine learning actually does really well. And then the third point that I, I feel I still owe from my first answer, and that touches both on ethics and on all of these advances, is the benefit of having an open and communicating world and international initiatives. It's something that we've seen in COVID-19 play out so effectively that people were open and sharing. And that was one of the reasons that advances were accelerated so quickly. And that is true for lab methodology. It's true for how we collect data and share it in the context of the Human Cell Atlas. And it is extremely important in the context of ethics so that data is on the one hand shareable, but on the other hand adheres to the relevant ethical standards that are in some cases the same and some case varies across the world. And at least in the United States, I think there is a huge appetite for these international collaborations together with initiatives like the Lifetime in Europe, which allow us to really understand humans across the globe rather than just in each place um, separately. Thank you, Anna. You've referred yeah. plenty, so how do we turn that into policy? I'm amazed by uh, this uh, discussion. I find it really fascinating, I have to say. But what I wanted to add to this, I, I find that actually there's also an ethical component in making sure that uh, the re uh, research that is happening is actually being picked up uh, and come to uh, fruition and use uh, at the end of the day. And I think... Uh, for this to really happen, we need citizens to understand and to be engaged and to really request that this is happening. Um, uh, we have also a lot of, let's say, dark forces operating in the opposite direction. I'm thinking about fake news around science and anti-vaxxers and all this. You, we, we cannot ignore that this is happening at the same time. So you need to offer something in the opposite direction. Uh, and I think, you know, considering also like the classic way of doing science where very often uh, scientists ended up, you know, saying, you know, wh who's going to pick up what I've produced now? I, I don't have the means or uh, the resources to, to take the, the things to the full use. Uh, I, th I think this is what we're trying to achieve with the Horizon Europe program is really to help that process to go uh, further and to really point at potential users uh, we really hope that this will be um, uh, be, be useful in, in, uh, in uh, as, as we go along. So I think uh, there, there are many things that were said here about uh, the, the um, um, I, I, what I appreciate, appreciate very much what Christine said about uh, the strong engagement uh, by the citizens also for the cancer mission. I think it's an absolute prerequisite in order for that to be a, a success. So there is a strong link here. And I would like to say also, that uh, I think is absolutely essential that top scientists, like those who are engaged in the Lifetime Project, are coming into the Horizon Europe program fully ready to work in the context of these uh, projects with this new approach and with a little bit of a new mindset to, to, to reach out to wherever we need to go. Thank you. Genevieve, you're raising your hand. <laughs> I, I just uh, wanted to, to, to react to this because I think it's uh, one of the very important aspects of uh, what we have uh, really uh, tried uh, with uh, Lifetime uh, because it is absolutely essential that there's an understanding and a better understanding of what is achieved and what can be achieved. And that is done together with the people so that they feel uh, it's important and they want it because that enables an earlier adoption of things if people are in the, in the flow from the beginning. So we've heard how it has been complicated uh, during the past year with the COVID-19, but we've learned lessons, Stefan said it. And I think uh, we should avoid to, uh, to, to be in situation where people are uninformed and with the fake news can uh, embark into areas that could be detrimental uh, for their health. So uh, I think we, we, we really need to speak up and engage. <laughs> That's definitely uh, taken. Very good. I want to come back to, um, to, to the question of, um, of star researchers or entrepreneurs living to the US, because there's, uh, the reality is that uh, there is massive investment in, uh, in biotechnology 
uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, but much less in Europe. So uh, that, that may be a question for you, Manfred, maybe if you'd like to, to take it, but how do we make sure that, uh, that Europe accelerates uh, those breakthrough technologies and multiply them in light of everything that we've heard, uh, the, the technological aspects is also important in this uh, in this encompassing approach. So, what what can we do? What can we do about it? You've been personally involved in the in the uh, beating cancer plan. Uh, you're also very active on the digital question. So, what is the solution here? Well, first of all, on the debate we had in the last minutes. Uh, it's great because that is part of the European way of life that we are considering a lot, that we are assessing what are the ethical impacts and so on. So that's that's classically European uh, thinking and, and discussing. But uh, I tell you, my feeling is that we are starting all the future developments, first of all, with considering the concerns and not so much with, uh, with, uh, with underlining the opportunities. That is also a thing where we where we block ourselves in a way in the developments uh, in, in our thinking. And, and that has to be changed. I tell you in the few days, the European Commission will come up with a concrete plan, how we deal in the future with the public data. So industry data and public data. Thierry Breton is responsible for this. And that has a huge impact on cancer because we know that in fight against cancer data and the public data, the health data have a huge, have a huge importance huh, to, to, to strengthen our research uh, in fight against cancer. And, and, and in all these aspects, whenever we discuss this now with the commissioners responsible, with our colleagues in the European Parliament, there we focus first of all on data protection, data privacy and so on and so forth. And nobody would ever say that's not important. Everybody says it's important, but that is always the gravity. That is always the center of the whole debate and not so much the chances, the opportunities, the perspective which we can get if we do it uh, in, a, in a reasonable way, no doubt about this. That is the thinking we, we have probably to consider and to change. And that's why probably it's more attractive for real top researchers to go to the US and to other uh, 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 regions in the world, because there is another atmosphere about ideas, about creativity, than we have it in Europe. Uh, don't get me wrong, I don't want to make copy and paste about other regions. I like the European way of doing things, no doubt about this, but rebalancing it. And if you may, if you may, uh, allow me, I would, I would also add one point to this moral and ethic question because we are discussing this on a European level. And I, I must say my biggest problem is, my biggest uh, concern is that we have such an unequal treatment of citizens in the European Union. Again, in the fight against cancer, in the east of Europe, people have 40% less chance to survive with a, with a cancer uh, disease than in the, in the west of Europe. And that is what concerns me a lot when we speak about this moral perspective. So why are we not good enough to make a good exchange of information on therapy, on prevention, on whatever happens? So why are we not capable to manage this on European level in a better way? And that's why, again, what also Stefan said, it's a big, a big momentum 2020 because the first time we have now the health union presented by Stella Kyriakidis on the table that we really invest a lot on European level to make Europe better in this common, common challenge to, 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 to protect our citizens and to make therapies available for everyone. So that is my real question when we speak about this uh, aspect of, um, of moral questions in the European Union. Very good, Stefan. I yeah, just just wanted to add uh, to to this uh, to the to your question that you um, raised about uh, companies moving or, or or individuals moving over to the U.S. I mean, what Manfred is saying is certainly true that there is a different mindset uh, about uh, can do versus can't do uh, between the U.S. and Europe. But I think there is a there is a more important uh, issue at hand, and that's uh, that's capital. Uh, so the available, availability of, of private capital, typically from venture capital in the U.S., is just at a very different level. And only slowly but surely, the American venture capitalists are uh, starting to, to understand that actually uh, they can also invest that money here. Um, but, but one thing is investing venture capital. And then the next one is having access to public, uh, uh, to going public uh, on stock markets. Since the internet uh, bubble burst in Europe, we're having really difficulties in, in, in financing through stock market uh, money, uh, uh, 
startup enterprises in, in Europe. And um, so most uh, also corporate venture arms will only invest into companies that ultimately seek to get listed on the NASDAQ in, in, in the United States in the end. We need to come up, uh, I would hope in Europe with a way of creating a, a, a vehicle that allows for something comparable to the NASDAQ that is also sufficiently capitalized uh, in Europe. And, and ultimately, I think capital is mobile. Uh, but if that always translates into incorporation in the US to be listed in the US and then tax paying in the US and value creation in the US, uh, then I think we're really short sighted on the European side if, if we don't pay attention to that. I think the first step we're already making and, and uh, uh, with Nikolaus who's here, uh, him and I, we've discussed this many times uh, how we can keep actually a company uh, that would be founded in Europe uh, and, and still potentially have access to US capital. Uh, but, but I think we need to ask also politically, ask ourselves the question how we can better handle that. Very good. Uh, can I, Anna, there, is, um, there are questions in the chat about your invitation to join Horizon Europe for lifetime uh, researchers. So, uh, and it's interesting because we know also that there is the, uh, that there is um, with this question of venture capital and the importance of, um, of raising private capital uh, here in Europe and to keep our uh, star researchers and, uh, and entrepreneurs here in Europe. So the EIC is a big novelty of Horizon Europe. Uh, there is, uh, however, Lifetime is a very bizarre beast. Uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry, because they are the two coordinators, so sorry to call it a beast, but it has a very encompassing um, uh, perspective approach. So, and you don't have to answer if you, if you can't or if you don't want, but just through which window should they go? Because that's from what we've understood, there is plenty that needs to be taken into account and, uh, and there is, uh, the technological side, there is the, um, the, the science communication side, the, uh, the patients onboarding, the ethical side, the early detection side, and up to the, to the treatment, and not only to one disease, cancer, but a lot of them, several kind of disease. So what's your recommendation, just to put them a little bit at ease tonight? Well, my recommendation is to uh, really uh, put it very short, keep a very, very open mind to the opportunities that are there. Uh, so um, maybe I didn't emphasize that enough in my pre presentation, but the idea is really to spell out uh, in the health cluster uh, what is expected in terms of, of the outcomes, but not, not how you're going to get there. This how to get there is really the task of the applicants. And I think we give more freedom now in the, the way we are writing the topics in the future to, uh, you know, um, for people to come up with their own initiatives and their own uh, solutions. And then there's the task to convince the independent experts that are evaluating the various proposals that are put on the table to, you know, to decide what is most convincing in terms of approaches. But we're not saying you need to use this or that approach. We're just saying we would like you know, this outcome uh, that ultimately will have a certain societal or economic impact. So I think it opens up m more than it was before uh, for various approaches. Uh, so I don't perhaps think that you can take the whole lifetime project and sort of uh, take it as, as an in, in full uh, part and, you know, uh, into a nice slot that is sort of designed uh, for that, but you will find, I'm sure you will find many opportunities in different contexts, in different topics. Uh, if I talk about the, the health cluster now, but also obviously in the European Research Council, uh, and we shouldn't forget that, that, that. That's a very important source, I think, also. So those are two obvious entry points, but you know, keep an open mind for what you can offer, because I think we cannot work uh, with supporting research that's based only on, let's say, uh, uh, old uh, knowledge that is not offering the best that scientists or science is able to, to put on the table today. Uh, we cannot use, uh, we cannot base application uh, or translational research based on, you know, outdated or, uh, uh, you know, mediocre quality uh, fundamental research. We need to be developing 
at all fronts at the same time. And there's certainly uh, room for anyone who has something attractive to offer also on the basic research side in, the, in, in various contexts. That would be my, my, my recommendation. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Angelica, you wanted to come in and I just, uh, I just ask you to make a short comment and then sure. Christine. Anna, please forgive me if I disagree, but an endeavor such as Lifetime lives from the complexity and from the interaction of different fields that have never worked together. So if you come with more conventional approaches in specified calls uh, that are disease oriented, like in the cancer mission, this fruitful interaction is stopped. The EU flagship project was the ideal instrument to fund such endeavors as lifetime and to stop it um, has not been replaced by anything that I see that can replace it right now. Of course, people can um, now answer 100 calls in 100 different sub projects, but it's not the same because the resulting research will then be fragmented fragmented and the important learning from each other and applying from one field to the other is not is not possible anymore. Anna first and I think you've got a, a right to respond and then Christine. It, it's hard to discuss without having you know topics in I front know, of you yeah. but I, I, th I think they are so wide uh, uh, they're not going to say you know cardiovascular here or, or you know this or that there they, they're really open and inclusive and inviting for you know uh, um, you know to address certain problems uh, of, of societal dimension so I think maybe cancer mission is a little bit of a different um, uh, animal I'm talking about the sort of the bulk of the rest of the of the topics we have they are in, in my view I think they are quite inviting and I think um, uh, uh, what we shouldn't forget also is that we are striving to coordinate also between projects huh? once they're funded, that they work together. Uh, we also have the partnerships. We shouldn't forget that, uh, that we also engage with uh, member states and their finances in order to really do things uh, at the broad level. So we're looking, we're not looking to chop things up. But on the contrary, we're looking for various approaches to really bring things together. And I think if, if we have that positive mindset about the program, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we can, we can uh, get something really good out of that. Thank you. And we'd stay on that positive note. Uh, Christine, and then I have one final question for the panel. Uh, so, uh, so I'll remain positive, uh, even for uh, Angelica and for the rest of the panel. Um, let's put also our hopes in the new mission approach that uh, is happening in the uh, European uh, Commission strategy. Um, it's there to be able to provide actions, to innovate, to bring people together, when I said that we wanted to understand what we could not understand, we wanted also to put the tumor cell in its environment, but we also wanted to put the tumor cell in its environment, which is the person who has cardiovascular diseases, who has diabetes, and who is living in different environments. And that also is important. So I think the, the comprehensiveness of the lifetime is also a, a way to move forward, and that can be maybe find a place in the actions that will result from the, uh, the mission board. We only recommend, right? In the innovation uh, aspect, which is crucial for us and which has been underlined by our stakeholders uh, that we have questions, including patients, um, we have a specific recommendation where we believe it's important to innovate in the innovation to have different uh, means of trusting the different stakeholders who are going to work together. And that even uh, pushes to maybe new innovative ways of having patents, which probably may help uh, to provide the translational of the research finding for, for the impact. And we have also thought that we could use uh, the tools of living labs, which is really a concept which really fits well the, the mission approach where you keep bring people together to answer a specific question, including citizens and startup and SMEs. And the trust that can be inside these living labs can may, maybe move certain walls which are a bit too strict for our innovation. Thank you. Abby, if you want to come in, so that we, uh, and then we, we will wrap up the panel discussion. Go ahead. I will, I, will, uh, I will make two comments. First of all, I wanted to reinforce Christine's point on the whole patient, you know, the tumor cell inside the patient who has an inflammatory disease or a cardiovascular disease. 
when you actually develop medicines, you think about that question all the time and it is a major stumbling block downstream, but it often happens late in the process and the earlier we understand it, the better. The second point I wanted to emphasize from my perspective actually of not working in Europe is the importance of uh, ecosystems, both virtual ecosystems that we've gotten a lot better at actually, unfortunately, it's one of the silver linings of this unfortunate pandemic, um, but also physical geographic ecosystems. I've, I've lived in two of them, one on the East Coast in the, in the Boston area and now in the West Coast in the Bay Area. These are remarkable things. People move about, they bring and move knowledge with them and they bring a lot of energy and experience and expertise. And I think lifetime has the potential of being that kind of ecosystem. So I wanted to put a, a strong plug for the extra value that this brings that you, you reap benefits 20 and 30 years later, you still keep reaping those benefits. Thank you, Aviv. I think that would be the, the word at the end uh, for this panel discussion. Uh, I'm sorry because there's I had more questions. There are more, more questions on the chat. So I think I'll ask the lifetime colleagues to, to answer as much as they can on the chat. Uh, I want to thank very much the, uh, the, the speakers on the panel. And I'll hand over to Nikolas Rajewski for, uh, for, for conclusions. Uh, Nikolas, you're uh, the other coordinator of the Lifetime Project, so over to you. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn, and uh, thanks everybody uh, for the discussion, which I really uh, enjoyed uh, uh, very much. And I think the many questions uh, and uh, also the um, uh, enthusiasm from panelists during the discussion shows we need more of this and more interactions and speak uh, more to uh, each other um, to, to find the best way to move forward uh, uh, together. And I think, uh, Anna, that uh, everybody in Lifetime is open uh, for, for that. Um, I, I think what is clearly emerging um, is that there's a need to interact with society in ways that uh, patients are uh, really at the center, that the citizen patient is at the center of, of uh, information and, and uh, interactions and opportunities and really sees the benefit of uh, um, um, the approaches uh, that science uh, can offer. We have actually estimated this uh, in our st uh, strategic research uh, agenda, which is published. Uh, so that we actually estimated uh, the, the impact outcome for the individual European citizen. And you know, I will not go into details just to say that this uh, is an immense um, even under conservative assumptions, a really immense value that could uh, be brought by uh, cell-based uh, uh, medicine uh, as proposed by, by Lifetime. Um, I also wanted to, to say that uh, not visible here, uh, but uh, behind uh, the discussion are hundreds of scientists, and I would argue uh, the best amongst the best brains of Europe have come together behind this unified um, uh, idea to approach diseases in this very new way. We never approach diseases uh, in the way that we are, are proposing or we have the opportunity now. And I would like to, to just uh, say uh, um, uh, one thing that, the, that it was said by Aviv, of course, uh, and by others, but I, I want to say maybe again, what is happening now is that we get the molecular data of each individual human cell in, in a tissue that tell us, inform us about the decision making of the cell. So why is the cell uh, um, doing certain things? Why is the cell getting sick? And also what are ways out of this? So how uh, can you interfere? How can you target to make the cell push it back uh, to health? These are truly gigantic data. We talked about uh, the genome. Uh, I'll be done in a minute, Marilyn, no, no, no panic. Uh, so uh, the genome uh, 15 years ago was huge, and we talk about the genomics area. Now genomics is happening fr uh, from the computational scale at every cell that we are simultaneously assaying. So uh, you, you, you're, you, we are talking in a single experiment when, when, when we do uh, 10,000 cells, let's say, or, or maybe a million soon, we are talking about data that are genomics times a million, roughly speaking, in complexity. 
And this is not just big data, it is informative data. It tells us about why the cells are becoming sick and how we can target them. So now comes a real point. It is the first big use case for machine learning, okay? That we can really leverage to um, uh, understand uh, these kinds of patterns better and maybe predict uh, um, better, uh, find not only biomarkers, but also targets how to uh, um, interfere. These kinds of data simply didn't exist before. So you could not leverage machine learning, which we now have at our hands. Third, I want to say that the Nobel Prize uh, given for, for CRISPR-Cas uh, is also instrumental for cell-based medicine because it allows us to interfere uh, with a system to uh, test predictions in, in, um, in uh, humanized uh, systems. And that will be also uh, essential to, to move forward. So I think it's a time of immense opportunities. I think the European community, Anna, uh, and Christine uh, has to some degree done its job. It has uh, come together uh, you know, across disciplines, it has unified, uh, and it is offering uh, to the citizens, Manfred, I think a, a really um, integrated way uh, to move forward. How to integrate this into the European uh, now politics is, is a very interesting way. Again, we are open to uh, to uh, solutions of uh, uh, various kinds as long as um, we move together uh, forward. I mean, really together. So that's what I, I wanted to say. Uh, in closing, I pass by on my way to work every morning a monument to a certain Rudolf Virchow. Uh, he actually published uh, the book where he said uh, um, that human cells are the units to understand if you want to really understand and uh, treat disease. I sometimes stop and look at uh, this guy, the monument, and I think, yeah, we are in a time where we can really, as Europeans and together with Aviv and the international community, really uh, make this vision a reality and um, improve in a fundamental way healthcare. Thank you, Nikodas. This is a, a really nice to, to end this discussion. So as we are a few, uh, few minutes uh, uh, past six, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank all the, the speakers first for uh, this uh, very enthusiastic and uh, dynamic debate. I'd like to thank you in the audience. You've been in high numbers uh, and until the very end. So that's uh, that's a proof that of the of the importance of this debate. So thank you. I'd also like to thank the staff in the background, both on the on the lifetime and the science business side. Uh, thanks to you as well. Uh, as, well, as I said in the, at the beginning, the video recording of the debate will be available and, uh, and I'm pretty sure we'll hear again uh, soon about, uh, about Lifetime. So uh, with this, uh, thank you again and uh, I wish you a very nice evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Many thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, Marilyn. Bye. I will leave. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.